Good evening, friends. I welcome Pranam Bhai to this last uh, session of our conference to talk to us on the subject of royalty entries for data services, how they will be impacted by these kind of debts provisions. Almost all of us have heard Mr. Pranam Saika, uh, but still let me introduce uh, Mr. Pranam Saika formally. He is a partner in Ernst and Young and is based in Mumbai and is a national tax leader of tax practice for the technology communication in the integrated industry. He has been a gold medalist, chartered accountant, and he has attained all India ranks throughout. He, as you listen to him, you come to know that he is more like a professor and he will explain things so systematically that all complicated things will look to us as if oh, this is so simple. But behind that, how much thought and knowledge and experience is there is something which he only knows. Friends, I'm sure we can look forward to a very uh, enlightening session. But before I request him to begin, may I request our president, Mr. Parra Sabla, to present to him a moment of as a mark of our love and affection and charity. Sales. Given that so much is going towards 
the internet, e-commerce, and e-enabled services. So increasingly, these digital enterprises find themselves in a spot where, in a very sweet spot, where they can probably arrange their affairs in such a manner that most of the profits sit legitimately according to the current rules of taxation in jurisdictions which are low tax jurisdictions. Because they are pretty much neutral as to where some of these things sit, like the server and so on and so forth. So that again is a deep challenge facing tax authorities across the world and no less in India. We have in India, of course, several judicial rulings which have dealt with these aspects, both in connection with digital businesses or in connection with schemes, arrangements where we have tried to minimize taxes. What the OECD and the G20 are very keen now to do is to try and implement some of these BEPS action plans to try and ensure that fair legitimate share of taxes are available and collected by each of the tax regimes and jurisdictions. India, of course, is also keen when it comes to BEPS. It has its reservations, though it feels that we need to go far beyond and probably also relook at the allocation of tax in rights, which is presently not what the OECD seems to feel needs to be done. But necessarily, India's view is that we need to actually plan even further and we look at some of the taxing rights. That's not on the OECD agenda, but surely on the Indian agenda. What we will try and do this afternoon very quickly is look at some of the digital economy business models, whether it is cloud computing, virtual storefront, online advertising, whatever, some of the key areas in which we see businesses operating when it comes to the digital space. We will look at, again, a case study on what happens if there are excessive royalties and FPS is paid, one of the items that we saw on the previous slide, <coughs> trying to minimize profit in high tax jurisdictions like India and maximize profit saving comes in tax savings. We will look at some structures of planning when it comes to royalty and FPS, and we will look at an international planning structure as well, the double I structure as we call it, and what is the fate of it in the context of this. <coughs> okay. So moving on, if we look at some of the digital business models currently in work, <coughs> I'm sure this is something that is the future here. And what we are looking at here is a cloud computing business and we pick one typical example of how this operates. So here is an FCO, which is in this business. It has its network of computers, servers, located across a lot of what jurisdictions. It has various softwares embedded in and housed in various servers in different jurisdictions across the world. There is an ICO, which is an Indian bank, which actually has branches all over the country and probably even some branches abroad. ICO has its customers as we typically see. And what ICO is looking for is a net banking service offering, which it can offer to all its customers, clients, account holders, borrowers, savings, fixed deposits, whatever, all the accounts. What it does is, it approaches FCO, which is in this cloud computing space. FCO has a service offering, which would enable ICO to offer the net banking facilities, services to all its customers. So why ICO is looking for this particular offering to offer to all of its customers? <coughs> FCO has this particular product, which it says I can ensure that I will customize it to your computers, your systems, your methodologies and ensure that for all practical purposes, each of your customers, when he logs in, he is able to operate seamlessly on the net. When ECHO does this, effectively what it will do is, it will create a customer interface specifically for ECHO. And mind you, ECHO has various customers, it offers this 
particular product to different banks across the world. ICO will be just one of those customers. But what ECO will do is it will customize its interface, provide an access code, which ICO in turn can operate in a manner that it can offer to each of its customers, depositors, borrowers, and so on and so forth. The offering will be so customized that when anyone logs in, he feels as though he is going to the Indian bank himself. So the entire screen, look at the, the ICO bank's logo will appear. One will feel as though he is really operating the system and computers of ICO bank itself. But actually it's operated by ICO. Now the question obviously is that when ICO and its branches which will operate here by inputting their data. The customers log on to this website and end up straight at this particular offering of FCO. And whether a payment that ICO will make to FCO would be subject to Indian taxation. For all practical purposes, one can assume that the servers of FCO are not located in India. In any case, they are not located in any particular country and they are located maybe different jurisdictions across the world. Most of them might be tax friendly jurisdictions anyways. The way this will operate is ICO will input all its key data and mind you all this information, the agreements will be such that FCO will ensure that all the data remains completely confidential and, and secrecy confidentiality is key. And FCO provides sufficient comfort to ICO that all of its systems, software, servers will ensure complete confidentiality. But ICO will input all of its data into the system. Various branches will do the same. So the points that really arise here are the arrangement that we are talking about will involve allowing, so FCO allows ICO, its branches and sometimes even the customers to input data into the system. That's one. Second, if we look at it the way it works, FCO and the systems, processes, whatever that it has, will ensure that this data is stored on the servers that FCO has at various places. The third thing that happens here as a result of this whole arrangement, it's important to understand what is happening to be able to figure out what really the nature of the payment is, whether all EFTS or Third, so one, FCO allows the Indian bank, its branches, customers to input data. Second, it allows storage of all this data in its system servers. Third, the servers, the software embedded there, the, the uh, programs, algorithms will ensure that this data is processed and processed real time, very, very swiftly, as it is happening. So if I, if I withdraw some money and next moment I, a check comes in, it will ensure that the withdrawal is already debited or so on and therefore I see exactly what is my balance and what is the clear amount that I have in my bank at a given point in time. So the data is processed constantly, real time as it is happening. And finally, it allows the customers and the bank, authorized persons, to retrieve at any given point of time access to that particular information and data. That is what is high banking or net banking facility will permit. Essentially, we have to remember that this is the limited access rights that ICO, the various branches of ICO and the customers have been. ICO has no say, no rights to dictate as to where the server of FCO will be located, where this data will be input, will go, where it will be stored, where it will be processed. That is entirely the prerogative of FCO. What FCO is ensuring is this will happen seamlessly, there will be complete secrecy, confidentiality, there will be no lapses, blah, blah, blah. So ICO has no option whatsoever to say where the servers ought to be, where all of this will happen. The question obviously is that in this kind of a cloud computing service offering, will the payments that ICO makes to ECO be subject to Indian taxation? 
Necessarily, you can assume that EFCO, which is a foreign company, has set up its servers mostly abroad. We can assume also that most of the development work and so on has happened abroad. ICO will make two types of payments, of course. One, it will make a one-time lump sum payment, which will be essentially towards customizing of the systems that will be required on FCO site when this particular thing is activated. And second, it will make ongoing payments year after year annually, which will be based on the utilization and the availment of the services, depending on how many net banking services have been availed of given all the customers of ICO, the Indian bank. So depending upon the number of bits or the number of transactions, the number of excesses, utilization, which will electronically get recorded, ICO will have to make an ongoing payment year after year. Remember that while all of this is happening, I have no access, I as in ICO, has no access to the software, programs, whatever of FCO. Necessarily, what I have access to is I can input my data, my data is stored, my data is processed, and I have rights to retrieve or access the processed data, finished goods, so to speak. I have the right to access, retrieve that processed data. While I have all of these rights, I do not get any rights to use that particular software to make any derivative from those softwares or to copy, modify in any way, change, reverse engineer, whatever to do with that software. But necessary, on the servers of EFCO are sophisticated softwares, programs, algorithms which will continuously be processing this particular data. And when I am inputting my data, necessarily those software enable me to input my data. Similarly, when I am accessing or retrieving my data, those softwares permit me to access or retrieve my data. They check my credentials, whether I am an authorized person, so on and so forth. They give me just the right amount of data, nothing more, nothing less, at any given point. So all of this is happening in this environment. And the question is, what happens to this payment that ICO makes to EFCO in regard to both the original payment as well as the annual payments? And our view is obviously that in such a case, whether it is under the domestic law or under the treaty, this should not be regarded as royalty or fees for technical services in all probability. Of course, each case will depend on its own facts. But most situations and facts that we have observed, this would not be regarded as royalty of these particular services. One, ICO has no control whatsoever, no exclusivity whatsoever. As I said, EFCO has several banks as its customers, and not merely banks, banks is one service of it, but various customers in its cloud service of health. ICO therefore has not got any rights to commercially exploit, reverse engineer, use, copy, modify whatsoever to the software that is embedded in any of those servers. It has no right to use the equipment at all. So if we look at the definition of royalty, do I have any right to use? No, EFCO has granted no right to use any equipment or software so far as ICO is concerned. <coughs> What ICO has rights to is merely the right to avail of the services. The equipment and the software belongs to EFCO, are of EFCO, and no doubt, of course, will be used by EFCO for offering this particular service, net banking facility, to ICO and its customers. But there is no use or right of use that is being provided to ICO by EFCO. EFCO is merely providing it a standard facility, a service, based on the equipment and software that is installed by EFCO and which will be used by EFCO, of course, while providing this particular service. Second, can we say that there is any process that ICO is paying for? So, once again, our view here is that it is not that ICO is paying for some process secret or otherwise. It has in any case no rights whatsoever to alter, fidget with, change, 
modify, touch upon any of the processes that are taking place. What F2 is assuring is that you can input your data, we will store your data, we will process your data on the daily world, and we will ensure that the right end product is available for you to access for the drive anytime you choose on a real time, regular, consistent basis, 24 by 7. Here, therefore, what is relevant to ICO and what is happening is FCO is rendering a service to ICO and that involves all of this, including the processing of the data. But that processing of the data is being done by FCO as part and parcel of the service offering. And therefore, there is no question of royalty even on this one. Again, there is no imparting of information or knowledge on the part of FCO to ICO. If at all what FCO allows is, as I said, merely the right to input data, store data, pro the processing of the data is being done by FCO and the right to access data. And therefore there is no knowledge, no how, information that is being imparted upon, much less information which we can say industrial, commercial or scientific in it. And therefore all in all, clearly we feel that this is a case where the consideration that is being paid by ICO to FCO is for rendering of a service which is not any managerial consultancy or technical service which involves any human element as we understand it and therefore cannot be regarded as either royalty or FTS under the domestic law. Under tax treaties of course typically the definition would be even narrower. It would not be therefore in the nature of royalty and the most treaties that we are talking of. And absent FTS, even if there is a typical FTS clause we should be out, but if there is a make available element in the FIS clause in the treaty, even better, this cannot be regarded as FIS under the treaty. I am sure that the aspect of permanent establishment has already been dealt with in some other sessions, I am told, and therefore we are not going into that. But I would assume that so long as there are no servers etc. in India, no equipment say in India, it's not that FCO is locating some equipment at ICO's premises here for ICO to do something. It should not also result in any permanent establishment and related taxes anymore. So I would feel therefore that this is business profits, not royalty FPS, and should not be subject to tax in India in absence of a permanent establishment. Moving on, once again a typical dis digital business model is a virtual storefront. What we are talking of here is that FCO is operating an India specific website, an India specific website for providing customer to customer as well as business to cons customer sales services via the internet. It's a typical marketplace. The web Website will display various products. FCO is not maintaining any stock of goods. It does not give any delivery. It's only a virtual marketplace. FCO is earning revenues from the third party sellers whose products are displayed on my website. And it charges a user fee to the seller at the time when a sale actually crystallizes. So that's a typical marketplace model. And the question is whether this amount would be regarded as royalty or FTS. And the user fees which the Indian company or seller pays to this particular company, FCO, would be subject to that. The only presence that FCO has here is by way of an affiliate, maybe an ICO, an Indian company, which offers various support services such as marketing, local customer support, and at times even collection of monies from the various sellers to whom user fee is charged. And the question is does this amount to royalty or FTS? I think clearly the decision of eBay should be of great help here. We do not feel that here there is any form of service offering. This is not a managerial or consultancy service offering by FCO. This is merely providing of a platform by FCO to the various sellers and in, indeed even buyers to come together and for conclusion of a sale 
since this is merely for providing a standard facility or a platform, there should not be any royalty or FPS risk here. So clearly, one, this is not mandatory or consultancy services. Also, this is not in the nature of technical services. If at all technology has been used here, of course, as it's used in most cases, why offering the standard facility or service? But apart from the fact that technology is used by FPS in providing the standard facility or service, this is not a technical service as referred to in the FPS definition. Again, there is no imparting of any information here, much less industrial, commercial or scientific nature. There is also no use of or licensing of copyright, patent or any equipment whatsoever and therefore it should not be regarded as royalty. Neither FPS nor royalty, therefore, they should not be subjected to Indian recording tax. Once again, I am not getting into the aspect of permanent establishment. I assume it has been separately dealt with. But it should typically not result in a permanent establishment as well. Again, assuming server is not in <clears throat> Moving on further, if you look at the next one, the online advertis advertising model. Typically, we are talking of an Indian company which uses the search engine of FCO to advertise its businesses. ICO's advertisements would be displayed on the screen whenever certain key terms are used by users on their search engines. So I search for something, depending on what keywords I use, my advertisement appears on the screen. The advertisement contract between FCO and ICO is again all done electronically. So typically FCO may not even have physical presence in India to a support services company in most cases. FCO of course charges a fee for the advertising that ICO does on its search engine or website. Whether the payment of this fee, online fees, would be regarded as chargeable to tax in India on the ground that it is loyalty or FPS. <coughs> Once again, whether we look at Pinstorm, whether we look at Yahoo, Right Flores, I think once again, so long as there is no server in India, one would feel that absent any major human intervention, which is once again very unlikely in this kind of a model, it should not result in royalty or FTS, because what is being paid for here is providing of a standard facility service, very little human intervention, there is no provision of managerial consultancy or technical service. Also, we are not making available anything here, so typically most treaties FIS clause should not apply. We move on to the next case study. Here is a case where we have FCO, a foreign company, and ICO, part of the same group. So admittedly, both of them are related enterprises, associated enterprises. Maybe FCO directly owns the shares of ICO, or indirectly owns it as the ultimate parent, or they are just sister companies with the same common ultimate parent. Whatever the case. FCO, however, however, has granted a license in respect of NUHA to ICO, for which FCO charges a royalty of 200 to ICO. So here's a license of NUHA granted by FCO to ICO. For this license of NUHA, ICO pays a royalty to FCO. Let's say that royalty is 200. A transfer pricing study is done which determines an arm's length price of nearly 80. ICO in its return of income voluntarily disallows 120 out of the total payment of 200 and claims a deduction of only 80. So effectively 120 is voluntarily disallowed by ICO in its return. However, the fact remains that ICO has paid 200 to FCO. And the question that arises is, what is the correct amount of tax that has to be paid on this 200 that has been paid by ICO to FCO? This is what we call an excessive royalty or FTS payment by ICO to FCO. And typically what we are trying to say here is there can be various aspects to it. If this 120 is disallowed by ICO voluntarily on its own, chances are that ICO is not going to be subjected to any penalty 
because on its own in its return of income it has disallowed the excessive portion of money paid. If it has paid adequate advance taxes, whatever else, requires its returns on time, even 234 ABC may not arise because it has in its calculations budgeted only AP as an allowable expense. Otherwise, of course, interest will be paid. But assuming all that happens, there is no penalty for sure, it has already made a disallowance in its return. It pays the taxes by claiming only AT as an expense. Because it has paid its taxes, interest liability also is minimal. The question is when ICO made this payment to FCO, it would have done some withholding taxes or ought to do some withholding taxes. And the question that arises is, what should be the withholding tax that ICO must withhold? Let us assume that under the treaty between FCO's jurisdiction of residence and India, the withholding tax on royalty is 10%. The tax rate is 10%. Can ICO withhold 20 of taxes or should it withhold only 8 of taxes on the ground that only 80 should be taxed, only 80 is being allowed to me or anything else? I would feel one that under the transfer pricing provisions, while if there is an upward adjustment to the income of ICO, meaning effectively ICO faces a disallowance of 120 out of the total expense it has incurred of 200. Voluntarily it has made that disallowance and its return. While that upward adjustment happens in the income tax return of ICO, there is no downward adjustment that will happen when FCO files its return. So FCO will have to offer the full 200 to taxes. ICO claims only 80, FCO offers the entire 200 to taxes. The question still is, is it still worth it? Because on that 120, even assuming FCO has to pay their full taxes on the 120 and is not limiting its tax to only 80 rupees of income. Still, if ICO had not paid the full 200 and had paid only 80, it would have then paid the 120 maybe as dividends, which would have been subjected to a dividend distribution tax. Right? And that dividend distribution tax might have been 20% or more. Instead of that, at least here what happens is I get away with a 10% withholding tax under the treaty. That seems to be the calculation of the two companies. And the question is therefore, even assuming that FCO cannot make any downward adjustment in its return, can it say that I will offer my full 200 to tax, not restrict my income to 80? Nonetheless, my tax on that 200 is 20. And so long as ICO has withheld 20 as withholding tax on royalty under the treaty, I am fine. Yeah, so there is a conscious excess payment, let us say. I feel mistakenly conceived by the enterprises as a cash repatriation mechanism. Does this work? And how will 120 be taxed? One is, if we look at treaties typically, the royalty article will say that if there are two related parties and affairs have been so arranged that excessive royalty has been paid. First of all, Article 12, 1 under the OECD will say that both countries will have a right to tax, residence country will tax it, source country will tax it, however, source country will tax it only to the extent of 10%. So India has only the right to tax. 10% withholding tax on the royalty. But if one goes further, Article 12 4 typically would provide this of the OECD. Most treaties will have a very identical paradigm. Which says that if, however, your affairs are so arranged that you are paying excessive amount of royalty, this 10% concessional tax rate will apply only to whatever is the fair amount of royalty, not the balance excessive part which will be dealt with according to your domestic law. So the concessional tax rate of 10% under the treaty will apply only to 80, not to the entire 200. The next question that arises is, 
what happens then to the balance 120? It is royalty, which India has a right to tax. An absent a recharacterization of this royalty. This balance royalty of 120 India can tax according to its domestic law, need not restrict the withholding tax to 10%, which is the typical rate for the other article 20 that India has come into in terms of allocation of tax rates. So on the balance 120, the withholding tax obligation on ICO will be at the rate of 25% and 115A, not at the concessional treaty rate of 10%. Also, not only is this FCO's obligation to pay by five years return, ICO ought to have in the first place, if it admits to 120 being excessive in its transfer pricing and its own return, ICO ought to have withheld tax at the rate of 25% on this 120. And failure to do so can result in all the necessary consequences, obvious consequences. So that's one. Now here we are assuming that this 120 cannot be recharacterized. A question may arise, is this royalty at all on which tax rate is 25% under 115A or should this be recharacterized and treated differently? As things currently stand, of course, there can be two views on whether this can be recharacterized <coughs> or not. But I would feel as things currently stand, till the steps thing progresses, or till God comes in, of course, I would feel this will continue to retain its character as royalty. So it cannot be recharacterized, it will continue to retain its character as royalty. And this 120 will be subject to tax at 25%. Of course, one can always argue, should McDowell apply? Can we say this is a sham? Can we really look at the substance of the transaction? What are the parties trying to do? and so on and so forth. But at least the way things currently stand, it is difficult to rewrite the transaction. What the treaty permits is to say that the concessional tax rate will not apply to this excess of 120. The treaty does not permit the source country to recharacterize this excessive royalty. It only disentitles the excessive royalty from the concessional tax rate of 10% that the treaty typically provides for the royalty which is an arm's length or fair amount of royalty. So typically that's where we will land up that AP will be subject to withholding tax at 10%, 120 will be subject to withholding tax at 25%. Both however continue to be characterized as royalty under the act as well as the treaty. The only difference being the concessional tax rate of 10% for withholding tax on royalty would be available only to the portion of 80 the arms length royalty. Moving further to some thoughts or planning ideas on what their fate will be if BEPS comes in. Here's a typical case where let's say the Indian company has some typical intellectual property rights. It's now thinking of having global ambitions. It says can I house the international exploitation rights of my IP which belong to me as IPO, the Indian company. Can I house this intangible, at least the international rights to it, to an overseas company, so that all future royalties when I start exploiting it abroad, because my ambitions are now global, when I go into different countries, at least the royalty that the different operating companies in various countries of the world pay to my IP hold go is not subject to Indian tax. So what it does is, Indian company sets up a wholly owned subsidiary, an Indian company again. The typical problem that arises is when I transfer the intangible in the first instance, if I transfer it to an IP hold to abroad, I pay a one-time tax because transfer pricing applies, I can only transfer it at arm's length price. Today's value of that intellectual property, whatever it is, minus my cost, which might be nominal, will be taxed under the red capital gain today itself in the hands of the Indian company. Thereafter, overseas in IP hold, co intellectual property rights hold, co, might exploit those rights abroad, maybe sitting in some country outside. And let's say UK as we have taken in this example. But if I transfer this IP to a UK company, when I 
India Co. I Co. transfer the rights to the UK company, even if it is overseas exploitation rights, it pays a one-time tax at the time of transfer of those rights. The one-time tax because UK company is a non-resident, I Co. is a resident, I Co. transfers IP to a non-resident, transfer pricing applies, I have to transfer at arm's length price, I Co. makes a capital gain and pays a tax. Subsequently, the UK company may exploit those rights by giving those rights, licensing those rights to various companies across the world, maybe in Europe, US, wherever else. And typically, the royalty then will not be pulled back into India because we don't have a CFC. And the royalty then ongoing every year will not be taxed. But by trying to avoid the royalty tax annually from the various operating companies abroad, I end up having to pay tax today on present value basis. Because I transfer the intellectual property today at a high value, which is our value. Now what this planning seeks to do is, Indian company forms a wholly owned subsidiary in India itself. So it's an Indian wholly owned subsidiary, not a UK company. And transfers this intellectual property to the Indian boss of the Indian company. Indian wholly owned subsidiary of the Indian company. Because it is a resident to resident transfer so far as my domestic law is concerned, both are residents. Typically I would not be subject to transfer pricing under 92 because both are residents. Second, in any case I say even if transfer pricing applies, section 47.4 will ensure that because I am transferring a capital asset to a wholly owned Indian subsidiary and I will continue to own the shares of this subsidiary for 8 years, I have no intention of selling the shares of this subsidiary. 47.4 will exempt any capital gain in any case, even if transfer pricing will apply. So I am saying I form an Indian wholly owned subsidiary. Transfer the intellectual property rights, the intangible, to that Indian wholly owned subsidiary. Claim 47 exemption, 47 for exemption. For all practical purposes, pay no tax. When it comes to future exploitation and so on, I say yes, this is an Indian company. Under section 6, it is a resident of India. Under section 6 of the Indian Income Tax. It is a resident of India because it is an Indian incorporated. But when it comes to the treaty with the UK, I say that this company is a resident of UK because the control and management of this Indian boss is in UK. So instead of forming a UK company, I have formed an Indian company. But otherwise I treat it like a UK company. For all practical purposes, the board of directors, the control and management, everything is done from UK. For all intention purposes,